sorry, sorry, Goyle Hav. Welcome to Goyle Hav. Today with me, I have Margot Eckenberg, who is a professor of literature at Tech de Montoro. Um, I'm trying to roll my R's, but I am an English speaker and it does not come naturally. Um, uh, Margot is amongst um, many of her roles. Um, she researches um, Mexican literature of the 17th and 20th century, particularly through the lens of gender. Um, so I did a little bit of um, digging because I read a book um, last year that was one of my favourite reads of last year called Cartuccio and My Mother's Hands by Nelly Campotheo. Um, and I was basically looking at academic articles <laughs> written on Nelly and I found Margot and I was like, yes, please. <laughs> um, and so she's been kind enough to agree to talk to me today. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here, Caitlin, and congratulations on the festival. Um, and I am one of, of many scholars, of course, who work on Campo Bello, but I'm pleased, of course, to to speak about her, always. <laughs> She's fantastic. Um, so I guess we'd better start with a little bit of an introduction to Nelly Campfeo. So could you explain a little bit about who she is and um, how, what she did? Absolutely. Well, Nelly Campobello is a really unusual figure, perhaps. I think it's, um, but not a, unusual in a bad way, unusual in a, in, a, in a really curious way in that she, never identified as a writer. So we categorize her today or catalog her as a writer when really she wrote three really interesting, especially two of three novels about the Mexican revolution. After having witnessed them, witnessed and lived through the revolution herself, she also has an early book of poetry. Um, and she's from Northern Mexico. So her, her background and really everything about her life is really confusing in the sense that there are a lot of gaps in her bio. So I think it's important to, to say that everything we say about her is taken with a certain amount of grain of salt because we don't have enough uh, information, although there are some really uh, key biographies of her. But we know that she's from Ch the state of Chihuahua, which shares a border with the United States. There's rumors that her father was an American and Campo Bello is a, in fact a Hispanicized version of Campbell, which might have been her father's name. The important thing is she has a very strong relationship with her mother and her sister, and she's going to write about those um, very much in, in her literature. And then as an adult, she'll move to Mexico City. She becomes very involved in the literary, not so much the literary circle, I would say the artistic circle. She and her sister were dancers. Um, again, very surprising, doesn't have training as a, a child in dance and yet goes on to be the director of the National Ballet of, of Mexico. Um, so it certainly had some kind of... So upon arriving in, in Mexico City, it's the post-revolutionary period. It's also the time in which the state is rebuilding um, after the revolution, investing in the arts, investing in education. And so she becomes a, a dancer and also has the opportunity to have friends in the literary world. And it's they who encourage her to write stories that she had in her mind or that she'd written in her notebooks. And her works will be published in the 30s and 40s, although she probably wrote those, those texts earlier. Um, and then, interestingly enough, Campo Bello had several affairs, but never marries. Um, we know she had a child who she lost uh, when he was very young. And she ends up alone. And the end of her, of her story is really quite tragic. It, we now know that she was basically kidnapped by her landlords and um, as an older woman and, and being frail and being alone. And she sort of dies in, in anonymity. And then later on, once, once sort of some of those facts become clearer, um, there's a little bit more done to sort of restore her, her, her name and her identity. But she has a very interesting role too in Mexican literature because on the one hand, she's sort of on the periphery, but then because of the burgeoning of feminist literary criticism at the end of the 20th century, um, she also plays a, a, a big role in terms of being a very original voice in, in Mexican literature. Um, the ending of her life is is just tragic, like you said, it is, it's horrible to read about really. Um, it's, it's such a shame. Um, it is her, it is her unique 
style and voice that is one of the things I loved most about Cartuccio in particular. Um, it's sort of written in a series of vignettes. I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about um, what is original about that structure and then also why she became um, so important to the feminist literary criticism coming out, um, you know, because it's, yeah, I'll let you explain. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it's important to, to note that because the revolution was such a, a tumultuous time and in terms of sort of state formation in Mexico, it is, we, we consider sort of within Mexico and, and in the larger Hispanic world that there is even a literature of the revolution. And so there's sort of this accompaniment of the political and, 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 and turmoil of war with a literature that also begins to represent this new, a new Mexico, a post-revolutionary Mexico. And traditionally in the canon, the Mexican literary canon, these were all uh, rather traditional war stories written by men about male characters. And Nellie's version of her own work of the, of the revolution, so her, her work is, is, is highly autobiographical. She, in fact, in the first version of Cartucho, she never names the narrator, which is interesting. In the second edition, on recommendation of her, her lover and the, the very important writer of the Mexican Revolution himself, Martin Luis Guzman, he says, oh, you better put in the, your name. It's confusing. And so she goes ahead and, and does that. Um, but, but that allows us to sort of mesh this notion of the author, the narrator, the main character, all being the same person. A highly subjective no novel in that she's writing these, as you say, vignettes, vignettes or episodes or sort of almost like little flashes of her own memories of, of her childhood. And she's gonna do so in a really extraordinary way in which we see a different kind of writing about violence. So not sort of the sanctioned idea of war, but rather the personal experience of war. And not only through, told through a woman's point of view, but a child, so a girl. And I think, you know, when we think about literature um, in general, the number of sort of extraordinary characters who jump up at us and who are girls can really be counted on just a few hands, right? That's changed quite a bit, but girls tend to be quite invisible. And certainly in a situation of war, nobody's paying attention to the girls. And yet here we have these tales of war told specifically by the, 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 this voice, this very original voice of a, of a child. And then we have an interesting kind of play in the novel too, in which the much older Nellie is remembering the younger Nellie. So there are times you will have noticed, right? Where there, you, you can be a little bit confused about the narrative voice. Is this the Nellie writing in Mexico City uh, in the thirties or is this the child who's in Chihuahua in, in 1914, 15? So it can be a little bit confusing, but I think it's really important to, to point out that not only is her novel extremely original in this way, um, but it's also a different way of writing. And I think that this is something really important as well to keep in mind with, with Nellie. Um, she's, she is on the one hand trying to, and she was criticized for this, she was trying to also defend the name of the revolutionary Pancho Villa, who in, the, in, in Mexico City in the, in the 20s and 30s when she he arrives here, she's dismayed to find out that he's considered a bandit and a criminal. And this was her hero growing up. Her mother was a supporter um, of, of Villa and actually helped him storing arms and so forth in the house. So she's trying to rewrite that history of Villa as another kind of, as a, as a hero as opposed to a villain. Yet at the same time, she also writes about all of those unnamed soldiers, all of those victims of the war who have no names or who are not remembered and not recorded. And I think that that's the really key element um, of Cartucho that helps us distinguish it from the more traditional novels of the, of the Mexican Revolution. Um, where yes, we have sort of this sense of like who's fighting on the, the side of the, 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 the federal side government and who's, who's or, or the military forces at the time and who's in the revolutionary troops. But in Cartucho, we have this sense of everyday people in her own town who she knew and who are being murdered constantly. And so writing this idea of writing about the dead men of her childhood, as she says, can, can seem kind of shocking to us because this is a child's perspective. 
but that was her reality. And so she's very much trying to convey to us these little episodes of her own childhood and what it meant personally, but also I think it can be another narrative of the Mexican Revolution itself. I agree. And the distance she puts, so I think I first came to her because I'd listened to a podcast called Revolutions, which covers the Mexican mm. Revolution amongst one of the many. It does excellent if anybody wants a podcast recommendation. Um, and then found this. And what is so different about Nelly's account as compared to that podcast, for example, or any other predominantly male told account is actually she's not interested in the what the the mechanics of the overarching civil war she's not paying attention or the revolution she's not she's not that you don't really know what's going on and um, all you know is from this intensely um you know female house sort of how first versus house and then there is the village and that's sort of where it then ends and that's where all, all the events happen mm. Absolutely. I think one of the, the big things we can talk about too, and, and, and I did want to take just a moment to mention Doris Meyer's name. She's the translator. And I think that uh, we have to celebrate translators and, and, and the fact that she also studied Campo Bello's work in the, in the 80s when, when really it was practically unknown still, although it had been very well received by her peers in her own time. And then it kind of fades. And, and as I said, due to um, more and more interest in feminist literary criticism, we recuperate her. But I think Doris Mayer also at one point she talks about, and I think she's very right, she talks about um, comparing the sort of male linear quest novel or even the war novel is always um, linear in this way. And, and Cartucho is anything but, it's a fragmented novel where we certainly do not have any kind of epic story of the heroine. She's not even a heroine herself. She's almost kind of a witness um, to what's happening. And as you say, there's a huge amount of confusion about who's who. Um, she herself is watching these, um, most of the episodes that she narrates in her novels from the, the home. And I think, and that's another really interesting topic to think about is sort of how from her own vision, the domestic and public places become confused. So sometimes the war enters into the house when military people come in or the arms are being stored there. And at the same time, her childhood is spent on the balcony watching the, what the soldiers are doing and in fact, killing each other outside of the, the window. And so we have this sort of confusion of, um, on the one hand, the, the public, the private domain is supposed to be this protected domain where women wait. Um, Nietzsche has a famous line of, you know, the, 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 the rest of the warrior is when he returns and his wife is waiting for him. Here we have a really different perspective, right, where Nellie's mom herself is involved, uh, not on the front lines, but certainly as a key player as, as the uh, supporter of Villa, but also um, this sort of blurring of the lines of what's the domestic space and what's the public space and when um, I think that too is a, a really another interesting way of thinking about how the narrative is crafted in a very distinct way to to express her subjectivity um, but in in such a way that it also brings the, the reader in even though we're confused as you say I think you're right Caitlin like a lot of the time when we're reading we're like okay and who's who now and is this are we still talking about the same person and something else to mention and to encourage you the audience to read the book too is that the vignettes are very very short and so sometimes we think oh well that can't be it it, it must continue and and then it doesn't and so we we're, we're constantly we're constantly struggling a little bit with the text but we're always engaged we always want to read more and see what what else is going to happen what do you think the importance of it being sort of this because another viewpoint that it's maybe challenging or whatever is it's semi-fictionalized like it's not fictional but I wouldn't have any problem putting it in a fiction part of a bookshop and sort of the um for me I think it achieves some of what fiction can achieve that actually non-fiction or journalistic accounts couldn't and I wonder what you sort of thought the importance of it being um what the word in that form is that's a really great question because um I think it's fiction as well. I think it's autobiographical fiction, but it's definitely fictionalized. But it's a really interesting question because during the revolution, there was sort of um, 
one of the most well-known revolutionary novels was printed. It's called um, Los de Abajo in Spanish by Mariano Azuela. He was a medical doctor who was on the, on the front lines and he published it in segments in a newspaper in Texas. And so readers at the time weren't really sure if what they were reading was fiction or nonfiction. Um, and I think that it's so, so it's almost a characteristic of the, of the writing of this time in that there's sort of this blurring of, and again, remember, you know, this is a time where many people in Mexico are illiterate. Uh, the revolution is really one of the first times where people begin to get a real sense of what the other parts of the country are like in Mexico. Most people lived within their own regions and didn't move out of them. So it was very difficult, I think, often to tell, you know, is this, is this fact, is this fiction? So I think it's very much fiction. Um, I think that there are novels and not just because it was one, Cartucho, for example, was one, once published in a collection of uh, novels of the Mexican Revolution, which I think gave it a certain status that perhaps if that hadn't happened, it would have been even harder perhaps to recuperate her work to, to come back to it. But I do think, um, I definitely think we could think about them as, as, as novels, but novels with a really, in fact, I think it's a almost avant-garde kind of novel for the time that she's writing, where we have uh, shifts in narrative point of view. We have a fragmented novel. Um, we have this idea of um, multiple voices, shifts in time. Um, so it's really interesting to think too, in terms of the Hispanic world, the big boom that we talk about happened in the 1960s with Carlos Fuentes and, and Cortázar, Borges, all the big names that, that, that we tend to identify with the 20th century and in the, in the Hispanic world. Yet they, they precisely are using these kinds of alternative narratives or, or fragmented narr narratives, partly due to reading Joyce and Virginia Woolf, by the way. But um, I think, you know, Cartucho in many ways and, and my mother's hands, Nelly's already doing this, perhaps much more intuitively. I don't think she, because she wasn't sort of the kind of intellectual who would have read uh, Joyce or Woolf. But um, so intuitively, she's already writing this really avant-garde fiction. Absolutely. It's it's stunning in its bravery and its simplicity to me. I think that um, often, I said this before at the festival, but what I find that I love the most in one particular way is sparse, simple language. Like, I think that always feels like the most honest and beautiful in and of itself and also in its... Um, uh, what she's in its in its in what it's conveying as well, and obviously, actually, what I have read is Doris Mayer's is la Mayer's language, and I was wondering, um, have you read both editions, and what sort of is notable about this translation? There's quite a lot of Spanish left in. There's quite a lot of names, place names, and um, words kept. Um, you know, that are then sort of glossed a little bit, explained a little bit. Um, but yeah, I was wondering, have you read both? <laughs> I have, I have read both because I often teach in English, even though I teach here in Mexico City. So I, um, I sometimes, do, when I teach Campo Bello, I, I some, we sometimes read her in English or Spanish or a combination of both. Um, I think it's a fantastic translation. I have to start by, by saying that. Just for backtracking for just one moment and talking about the sparsity, I did, there is sort of an anecdote about, about Campo Bello and when she begins to write that I think is interesting as well. Um, she was, nursing a sick friend, according to what we, we, we know, or we think we know, she was nursing a sick friend who was hospitalized at, before she published the first of all of these novels, which was Cartucho of the three. And um, as anyone knows, if, if, if you've uh, given care to someone over a long time, you, you run out of topics to talk about very quickly. And so she began to read and she read from this notebook that she had kept from the time that she was uh, pretty much a a young child. And she makes reference to that in the prologue uh, of, of Cartuccio. Um, and, and her friend was a writer, the, the, the person who's ill, and encouraged her, you know, said that those are, those are fantastic. Those are, and it might help un us understand a little bit this idea of the vignette form, because it was, they were in fact sort of her memories, what she jotted down. It can be extraordinarily significant too, though, when we think about this idea of the loss of identity during war. So her writing down some of the names, some of the events, some of the occurrences is a way also to give voice to those fallen soldiers um, and victims who were not soldiers as well. Um, and it helps, it helps us understand, I think a little bit 
the, the sparsity of her language and also the, the very short um, extension of each one of those little chapters or vignettes because she didn't, I don't think she wanted to really elaborate much more. She sort of kept those original stories, those original ideas and thought, well, what can I, you know, I'll, I'll make them a little, you know, perhaps a little more literary and certainly within the circle, I think she was in, she probably had friends read them, which is what all writers do. And, um, and so then the, 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 the final effect still sort of stays true to this idea of a journal or a diary or what she called her, her green book of dead, of dead men. Um, and then in terms of the translation, I think it's key to keep some of the, the words in Spanish certainly and the place names and the, the references to the, some revolutionary references. There's some things that just can't be um, translated or, I mean, I'm of the idea that all translation is interpretation so I happen to really like the way Doris Meyer reads Tancucho. I think if perhaps somebody else had, and my mother's hands, if it had been someone else, maybe if we hadn't sort of been on the same line of reasoning in terms of interpretation, perhaps I wouldn't have liked the translation as much, but I think it's an excellent translation. Um, I think it's very true to the original um, and it's necessary to have some of those footnotes, absolutely, um, because the idea precisely is that, well, at the same time, it's a novel very much, it's a very much a, a Mexican novel. It also uh, reaches well, well beyond the borders of Mexico, I think. And when I teach Cartucho, for example, we often talk about children around the world who are exposed to violence and who grow up to, with violence and normalize it. It's one of the things that shocks us the most if we haven't grown up in those kinds of circumstances, the fact that uh, talking about violence, talking about seeing guts um, are all kind of done almost with a kind of humor in the, no in, in the novel. And it can, be kind of, it can be shocking and disconcerting, but it helps us understand that children react and adapt to their environments. And if their environments are highly violent, then that's what they, they learn to know. Um, but it also is a, a reminder too of, of how, how children are victims and how they suffer terribly through war and that they're often invisible, right? That everyone's so caught up in, in the fighting and, and who's right and who's wrong that the children get forgotten. And as you, you pointed out well, Caitlin, I think, children don't even know who's who and who's on what side and what the political implications might be. As it is, Mexican Revolution is really difficult. There's lots of players and yeah. For some, for some historians, it's even a series of rebellions. It's not even a revolution. So mm -hmm. it's, it's discussed uh, a great deal, even more than a hundred years later. Yeah. And sort of um, a lot of the, even the soldiers, they're sort of the children who are herself and her siblings. And then there is also the soldiers who normally are even, even by someone who you've got to imagine is quite young. Maybe again, it's the blurring of young Nelly and old Nelly, because I don't think as a child, you refer to boys who are maybe 15, 16, they seem impossibly old to you. Whereas obviously then as an adult, you see them as children. Um, Cause I think pervade throughout the vignettes is this feeling that these are babies who don't know what they're doing and who are sort of just um you know their deaths have are tragic in this way and actually I think it's um something that's interesting that sort of like adds to um how for me this is a feminist text is that actually quite a lot of the um texts are named after these like dead boys or sort of you know like the lookouts like it's naming the um them in a different way other than their actual name and somehow it um manages to do both do you know what I mean like it manages to sort of portray these young boys in a very sympathetic and warm way absolutely and I think I mean I think you're I, I, it's definitely a novel that rethinks, or the, both novels that are they're, they're shorts that are in that the translation that you showed a moment ago, Cartucho and My Mother's Hands. My they, Mother's Hands as well. So sorry, sorry. Is um, translated by Irene Matthews. Irene Matthews. I wanted to just yes. give her a shout yes. out. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah. that was important. You're right. They do it together. Absolutely. Um, I think that um, mm -hmm. the both of those novels re-script and rethink gender category not necessarily intentionally the way we might from today from a feminist perspective, but certainly from the perspective of Nelly as she was remembering and writing and creating. So I think that um, absolutely, I, I think that we have women who are revolutionaries 
we have girls who, if invited to the table, might actually discuss something about what was going on and what they thought. Um, we also have boys who show different, as you say, different kinds of boys and young men and kind of that blurring of the line, right? We get the sense that many of the victims are themselves um, victims of the revolution in the sense that they're not entirely sure why, they, why they're fighting and who they're fighting for. And yet, um, we have the presentation of sort of distinct masculinities as well, right? We have boys that cry or who disintegrate or the boys who, the very first chapter of Cartucho begins with the relationship between Nellie's sister and a neighbor and how they played together on the street. And then of course the violence erupts in the middle of the play and, and he'll eventually be killed. But this notion of, um, you know, the, that soldier or, or or town member is mothering, right? He's he's mothering the the sister. That's the way it's it's presented to us. And there's another chapter where um, a vignette in which a, a young boy um, doesn't want to grow up because he feels that if he stays small, he'll somehow be protected from the violence. So we have these distinct notions of masculinity. Even the the the, the ultra macho re revolutionary hero who's Pancho Villa will be shown to cry at times. So yeah, definitely a blurring of what we think of as of, of very strict gender categories, which continue to operate a great deal in the Spanish speaking world. And so in the in, in the 19, beginning of the 19th, of the 20th century, 1910, 1920, the decades of the revolution, these categories were, at least in theory, were impermeable. And then what we find out through a and these kinds of novels is that the truth is that they really were not as, as strict categories as we think. I'd not even thought of it that way. You're so bang on. I hadn't even clocked that one of the things that makes those boys so human is that they are portrayed not as sort of, you know, as, as fully rounded humans, not um, just one definition of masculinity. And often they're sort of sweet, you know, I think a lot of them are sweet, a lot of them treat her mother well and, um, you know, play with them and, yeah. yeah. Yes, and the girls can be mean and awful. Yes. So, yeah. right, we don't have the sweet, yeah. you know, loving little daughters necessarily either, right, so we do definitely play mm. with those categories, absolutely. Mm. Something else I wanted to add too, also about you know, there's the intervention of Martinez Guzman in the second edition of Cartucho is also really interesting because he made some moral decisions. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that he wanted her to name her narrator, Nelly, as, as she's named. But in the parts that were, um, where there was the expression of sexual desire on the, on the part of the narrator, he said, no, 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 <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Your child is, you know, your, your narrator is too young. And he actually had her edit that out. So there's a, a chapter, yeah, there's a vignette, yeah. Where, where yeah, yes, that, that we, know, we know that happens because we can see the two, the two editions. So he, and you know, she of course let herself be edited in that way, but, um, but it's really interesting to compare the, the two versions, right? Because Freud of course says sexual desire begins at seven. So it would have been, you know, she was probably, um, expressing something she she transposes it it's in the chapter I don't know if you remember where she she talks about her doll and her doll being in love with the most beautiful boy in the town and so that I think that you know there's no question that she's transposing her own desire for him through the doll um, and then in in the original writing of that vignette she actually when they find him dead she she mounts him and Martin Luther's man says no 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 that you, you have to take that out so yeah, amazing. Oh, is there an English translation of the first edition? No. Mm. no. It's the project for somebody watching the best of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. If anybody's interested, I would really like that to love that. That's really like to read that. That is, I'm shocked. I'm really shocked. That is, I mean, I guess I'm not that shocked, but also I didn't know that. So, okay. um, Mm. Mm. Um, how do you think the um, structure plays into sort of um, this because it's an interesting structure it's not so it's divided the book Cartuccio is divided into three parts and you have part one that is the men of the north part two is executed which is by far the longest part and part three is under fire um, I was wondering how and um, what you think about that structuring I think it's given it's done to give a little bit more 
order and help to the reader. That's my intuition. I mean, I don't, I don't know honestly exactly the decision making process and why, why that was was done. Um, but I, I think perhaps we were mentioning a moment ago this this idea of getting a little bit lost in the text. Sometimes we're not entirely sure if the the following vignette, vignette picks up on the last one, or perhaps there's a mention of someone who was who appeared several vignettes back. Um, so I think it's simply to help order a little bit some of that disorder. I don't know if there's more to the structure than that. If there is, I, I we need to see it. Yeah, I remember feeling like both like sometimes it was completely somewhat, you know, somewhat arbitrary, like it's sort of, but then also like when you read it in like the executed is very clearly a series of accounts of executions. And so, yeah, I, I quite like it actually. Um, I think it, for me it works. So quite um, what we're talking about, like with the vignettes as well, there's a definite folk tale element to them and somewhat um, of a folk tale or fairy tales brutality um, in the, the brutality that isn't the description of violence, but is just that at the end of most vignettes ends with, and then he was shot or and then the bullet went through him or then he died. Um, and I was wondering if you sort of, for me, the again the sparsity of that language actually makes that more brutal um and more effective absolutely i think i agree with you and i i'm really happy you brought up the notion of the folktale because i think the oral nature of the language is really important um the very first lines of cartuccio for example says cartuccio didn't speak his name and i think it's extremely powerful on the one hand we have sort of the combination of, of speaking and silence. And I think silence is extremely important. As you say, the sparsity of it and not giving more details is very, is extremely powerful, both in terms of giving a sense of the, the death and decay and, and just this integration of the social fabric because of war. And at the same time, everything that's not being said, the names of the dead, the the, the burden, the pain um, on, on, on everyone. So I think it's I think it's really really important and, and folk tales, like oral literature, have this ability, of course, to also change a little bit as the story passes on from from, from telling to telling, um, which doesn't happen here because we have the, the, they're 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 kept in print. But we can almost imagine if we go back to that idea of of, of Millie as a as a caregiver in the hospital of her telling the same stories with with variations. Um, so I think that there is a there, there's definitely the importance there of what's not being said and the sparsity of the language forces the reader to sort of imagine and on the one hand the, the to 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 imagine the, the the toll of all of this and at the same time it also is this normalization of violence and death. So from the child's perspective, who's completely Im immersed in war. Um, this is just her daily bread. This is what she lives. And so it's presented uh, straight up, you might say. How do you um, structure this when you teach it? Are there any sort of points you like to make sure you include? Like I know you've written about sort of the anonymous um, sort of people in the book as well. Well, often when I teach this book, I begin by thinking about girls and encouraging my students to think about girls and, and in terms of girls' voices and, and what girls, what we know about them and how visible or invisible they are. And also the possibility and potential of girls writing about violence. So this is something that usually doesn't, they're not categories that we keep together in our own heads. And so I think we have to kind of enter into that space before we begin to, to work with Cartucho. Um, and I, I tend not to work too much on the revolution itself. We sort of leave that for later. Um, and the experience of reading, um, just like you, Caitlin, I think all of my students are really um, sort of um, blown away. They're, they, they're not expecting anything. And then they, they read these vignettes and they're really, really touched by them and shocked by them. Um, so, we, so we begin by, by by those working on those kinds of ideas, sort of, of girls having a voice and girls being able to talk about something like war and girls not having the same kind of distinction between sanctioned violence and unsanctioned violence. So in war tales, 
our stories of war, we always have the sense that there's a, a, a way of, of sanctioning violence, but war is okay because we're achieving um, the goals that we've set out for, for land distribution, for a more equal society, et cetera, et cetera. But in a girl's mind, um, the, she can't distinguish and, and has no interest in distinguishing what's, what's sort of sanctioned violence and what's not. Um, and so we, we deal with all different forms of violence. So for example, both how she's witnessing death, but also there is a very subtle allusion in Cartuccio to her mother being raped. Um, so a very different kind of, of, of violence that's going to be happening. Again, it's going to be sanctioned with a war. We know that that's a, a weapon of war, um, unfortunately, around the world. But for the, from the child's point of view, this is a, an invasion of the home and, a, and an affront directly to her, to her mother, a violation of, of, and also of the supposed sanctity of the home. And then she herself has the desire to kill that same character who's a general, who goes on to be a general. He's not a general when he attacks her mother, but um, she wants to kill him. And so she speaks in no uncertain terms of wanting to kill him and, and kind of mixes this idea. She says, I want to shoot him with a thousand bullets. Um, so it's kind of this play, you know, like that's how children play. Children have no real sense of numbers. It doesn't make, it doesn't matter to them that one bullet is enough. A thousand bullets seems like more efficient. And so it's, it's child's play, but at the same time, there's this real sense of, um, of hatred and indignation on her part of, of in wanting to re seek revenge for her mother. So the, the mother-daughter relationship also is very, very interesting and complex um, in, both of the, in both of the novels. But I think, um, the, the, you know, not to stray too far away from, from your question, the, this notion of playing with what's said and what's not said and how it's said. Um, and then with my students, we work a great deal on, on this sort of our expectations of what girls are, are thought about. And then even the other characters in, this, in the novel, what do they think of the girls and then how do they themselves envision themselves? So that's usually how I answer it. Um, and not to put you on the spot here at all, um, but do you have any other recommendations? Are there any other books that you teach um, for somebody who's looking for, um, obviously, you know, she's one of a kind, um, but, you know, sort of core texts that would be maybe less familiar, like, I, you know, Nelly Campaleo is not well known at all. And, you know, it's quite, it's a 20 quid book kind of thing to get yeah. hold of. So is there anyone else who you teach um, or anyone you studied sort of in your research that you think is really worth um, an English reader seeking out or Spanish <laughs> or, or Spanish reader? There's, there's so many, there's so many um, because, I mean, you know, I work on the whole the notion of, of the reception, critical reception of women writers and also how they, how they, they write distinctively. So I think that there's, some of their work hasn't been translated yet, but I think um, some of the the writers who come um, after Cartucho, I, writing at the at the same time, really it, it, it's almost impossible. We have a lot of women who are writing poetry, and there are some sort of early magazines that are aimed towards uh, uh, women readers, but sort of more sentimental kind of writing. In the in the mid twentieth century, we have a whole series of uh, extraordinary women writers in Mexico. Uh, Amparo Davila is one, Ines Arredondo, Elena Garro. I can certainly send them to you in writing. Some of their work has been translated to English, some of it hasn't. Um, and I wanted to perhaps comment on a much more recent text that I teach, uh, although it's very painful and very difficult, but it can work very well with Cartucho and my mother's parent which is uh, a novel called Sara Uribe. Uh, the novel is called Antigona G Gonzalez, and the author is Sara Uribe. And that novel has been published in a bilingual edition. If you give me a second, I'll, I'll pull it yeah. up from my, from my book. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. This, is, this is the book. It's called Antigona Gonzalez. Hang on, let me get it right in the middle there. The oh. author is Sara Uribe, and it's translated by John Plucker. It's a beautiful edition. Um, and the reason I often work with it with my students too is because I do teach these bilingual classes um, often. And so it has the Spanish on the one side and, and, and English on the other. And it's a contemporary Mexican version of uh, Antigone, of course, the Greek classic. But in this case, we have a protagonist who's looking for her brother who's disappeared. And so it's a combination of it's 
also very heavy and, and, and difficult. Um, I did not teach it uh, in, under COVID. It, I, I told my students, I'm sorry, there's some things we can't do, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary novel. It's really well done. It mis mixes nonfiction and fiction. It's quite a poetic novel. Um, and so it places Antigone in, in, in current day Mexico in her, her search for the, for the disappeared. Oh, there we are. That, that sounds like it's added <laughs> to my reading list. Um, that sounds really good. Um, sort of, is there, is there anything you'd like to cover that we haven't touched on with Nelly? Um, mm. We've, we've really touched on, on quite a bit. Perhaps, um, I think that we, we've talked quite a bit about subjectivity in autobiography and sort of writing her own story, but I think it's also important to mention before we, we end today that she's also writing a historical novel in a way, and she's also rewriting history. And I think that that's something else really important to keep in mind, um, because often women's writing can, can be pigeonholed in that way that, oh, sure, it's a great novel, but it's her story and it's, it's intimate writing and it's personal and biographical. Uh, but women writers often write about things that have, even though they are writing about themselves, they're still writing about um, uh, a historical episode and, and I think we can trace some elements of what was happening in 1914, 1915, specifically in the town of El Parral, where the, 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 the action takes place in Cartucho, for example, um, in the Mexican Revolution. So it is a way, it is another reading of, of the revolution. And I think that that's something that I, I do want to sort of point out because um, to not as as extraordinary as her subjective and intimate perspective is and I think that that's the, the perspective that allows us in literary terms to talk about this extraordinary narrative and the experimentation and voices and time and place and, and narrative structure at the same time um, it is a rereading it's a rereading of, of history and it questions it makes us it forces us also to reread the canon and I think whenever that happens it's something really extraordinary it makes us go back to those novels the more traditional novels written about the Mexican Revolution and say hmm what did they miss what's not here and so I, I think I, I would like to also uh, point that out and one other thing that we didn't mention much but I think is definitely worth thinking about and kind of pulling to our more contemporary times and if I were to teach my mother's hands um, in, the, in the upcoming semesters and I'm thanks to this talk I might I might do that I think it would be really interesting to think about different forms of, of maternity different the, 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 the mother-daughter relationship and the complexities that that relationship can can imply and entail um, and Nellie's relationship is very complex even through her writing with her mother it's it, she definitely idolizes her but there are moments where we notice irony or sarcasm and I think it's definitely Doris Mayer who we, who we mentioned already has studied it a little bit but I think it definitely is worth worth looking at again and particularly um, in Latin America today where reproductive rights are being uh, battled, the, the battle is taking place on the, on the, on the front lines, on the streets. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting to go back to a, a novel that, that's 90 years old and, and think about or 80, 90 and think about um, different, not only different constructions of gender categories, but different interpretations of maternity and what the mother-daughter relationship is like and what perhaps is different when a daughter writes about her own mother. So that would be something else to add. Yeah, I would agree, I, absolutely. I actually am, um, I, I definitely prefer Cartuccio to my mother's hands. So I am sorry for not sort of asking as many questions about it because it is really interesting, even though um, uh, Cartuccio is definitely my favorite. <laughs> Some bias there. <laughs> I, that's fine. <laughs> I, I mean, I've worked on Cartucho as well, much more. But but now that I think about it, probably yeah. Maybe, yeah. The other, I think the other the other novel warrants our our attention. Mm. Mm. And that relationship with idealization is definitely there because I actually think that's something I didn't like. Like mm -hmm. I felt like she was idolizing um both her father and mother in ways that I was just like <laughs> like <laughs> let's not idolize our parents kind of thing. Um, but um yeah. I actually think that's interesting. That's a more interesting way of approaching that is to actually like in, investigate that rather than just say, oh, I don't like it. 
I, yeah, I, and I think there's when we. I mean, I I don't like to 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 sort of emphasize the bio, biographical reading because, again, women writers are often pigeonholed in this way, and so we have to study their biography first, and then and then think about their writing. Whereas men are never asked to. We never asked to do the same. We can just study their fiction straight off. So, I, I I'm aware and wary of that. Yet at the same time, there's a lot of sort of blurred and blurry ideas here about paternity. And we, we definitely have a single mother who's had children with several different men. Um, Campobello herself decides not to marry, but has several affairs. Um, and, and then at the same time, this notion of a child needing the structure of the family. So I, I do think that there's sort of, well, there are complexities there, even within what is apparently this, um, as you say, the idealization of the, of the figure of the mother. And I think she certainly was a pillar um, in a situation in a, in a childhood like this, um, in which easily uh, a young child could be completely destroyed and, and lost. And Campo Bea goes on to have this rather ex extraordinary life, except for the, the very tragic ending. Mm -hmm. And so I think we can very firmly here say um, it's really worth the money. It is um, a book so worth reading and um, not like not least because many I think British and American um, people are actually quite unfamiliar with the Mexican Revolution and it's fant like, fantastic is maybe the wrong word to describe it but it is really like it's a hit period of history that um, I think everybody would benefit from studying um, so I think we've got a firm recommendation here from us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Margot. Um, this has been fantastic. I just, um, yeah, I can't believe you gave me the excuse to talk about Nelly for um, an hour here. And um, thank you very much. I was thrilled to do so. I was so happy to to know that that she was included in a, in a literary festival in Wales that, that's international. And um, I think it was extraordinary. I couldn't I couldn't possibly say no. And it was lovely to speak with you. <laughs> oh thank you very much and um, thank you very much to anyone who's watching if you want to see um the rest of our talks we're doing a few um i sort of try and mix in some um older female writers with sort of more modern um current translators and um, so this year i also have done a bit on simone de beauvoir you can go watch professor laura Hengehold talking about her um who sort of the argument there is that she's a fantastic writer and very much gets overshadowed by her um relationship with sartre and her philosophy more generally overshadows what is a fantastic literary body of work so that might be, if you've enjoyed today, you might enjoy that one. Um, so thank you very much for watching. If you're able, we do have a Patreon, um, if you're able to help us pay for the Zoom license and stuff like that, but no worries at all. And um, yeah, see you all soon. Bye, thank you, Margot, again. My pleasure, bye.